What's up, everybody? This is Nikki Duncan Smith, also known as Kershaw St. Johnson for allhiphop.com. And we're here. We're here with Brad and Wayne to talk about the, this amazing movie, City of Lies, that is about our beloved, um, the Notorious B.I.G. Well, it really isn't about the Notorious B.I.G. It's about his case and the LAPD's um, cumbersome um, or deceptive, um, I don't want to give too much, but how the deception in the LAPD and how to actually solve this case that's still kind of unsolved. So I'd like for everybody just to kind of introduce the all hip hop audience um, each other. So Brad, if you could talk about yourself for a little bit and then Wayne, if you can. Sure, okay. sure. Um, Brad Furman, I'm the filmmaker and director. Um, very honored to be here with you today. Very honored always to be with Wayne. Uh, Wayne produced the movie uh, with me and, and without him and Ms. Wallace, we could have never made this film. And uh, you know, it really is an investigation into the corruption um, institutionally of the city of Los Angeles and the LAPD and, uh, you know, the, the, the details and facts of what we uncovered in our version of a reinvestigation based off the book Labyrinth by Randall Sullivan. When I got that book, it was about almost a little over 10 years old. So I felt a deep responsibility to do a version of a reinvestigation. And in the Wallace civil suit, Sergio Robledo, who has sadly passed, was the lead investigator on the case. But also during Russ Poole, which Johnny Depp plays Russ Poole, uh, the lead detective you know, in the Wallace murder for the LAPD at the time, Sergio Robledo was his uh, supervisor at the time during his tenure for a, quite a long period. And Sergio was invaluable, obviously, prior to his passing in um, you know, connecting me to the Wallace you know, a state to Wayne to Ms. Wallace, but also really in helping me reinvestigate the case. And that's really where it all um, began for me. And that's essentially in theory and a bit of practice how Wayne and I got connected. Um, how y'all doing? This is Wayne Barrow. Um, first off, I want to start by at least acknowledging uh, a fallen soldier, a good brother. Um, uh, DMX, very, very powerful voice, um, spoke to the darkness in a lot of people and has had his own darkness through his life, but he was a shining light on so many different levels. And I just want to say a rest in peace to him and my condolences and prayers to his family, Rough Riders and uh, the whole team. God bless him and God bless you guys. Um, my man is notorious B.I.G. with my partner, Mark Pitts. Um, and in life and in death, I managed Miss Wallace and helped her manage the estate over the last 24 years. And um, came upon this film through the connection of Brad, of course, who reached out uh, indicating that he needed some help. And, um, you know, he was doing this wonderful film and um, we sat, we watched, we talked. And at the end of the day, it was something that we just couldn't pass on because it was too important to not only big story, but the culture of hip hop. Um, it's, it's very, very, um, in my opinion, um, thought provoking. Um, it's very, very strong in terms of the, the lead characters, Johnny Depp and Forrest Whitaker. Um, and in terms of the story, this is not just about Notorious B.I.G. And I wanna be clear on that because it's more about what we as uh, black and brown people face every day. Um, and that's police corruption, inequality, um, things that are speaking true to us today. Um, and I think that, you know, it was just as prevalent then as it is now, the difference is now it's more broad and, and more, more of a focal point because of social media. And I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we lost a friend, we lost a father, a son, and, you know, um, a lot of fans out here are still trying to understand what happened, no different than the family, but my obligation is to make sure that people hear the truth. Um, and that was the purpose of us, myself and Ms. Wallace coming on board to help navigate this thing to where it is now, uh, with a release date of April 9th today uh, for VOD. So go check it out, City of Lies, Siobhan Films. Let's go. I definitely think that, yeah, let's tap that up. Um, I definitely think that you guys made some really great connections in the film and you drove home some points that many people um, might have missed 
the idea that the LAPD were were hesitant to kind of go full in because they were in the shadows of the Rodney King, um, you know, um, verdict. Talk about the connection between from what you saw as presenting it as a drama, the LAPD's, you know, juxtaposition of the Rodney King um, trial and Biggie's trial. I think there was a culture of a, ra a race war that was existing inside the department that was born out of things post the era of Rodney King and the OJ trial. And politically, what happens is when you're dealing with this bureaucratic system, Russ Poole, as the investigator, for example, he was very simple in the fact that he just wanted to protect and serve because he believed that that was the duty that he was supposed to and agreed to do. Um, but politically, as we see in many businesses, and this is about business and money and greed and all of these other things, other things become priority. And that was not something that Russ in particular could really deal with. And that, that, that's really the beginning of the larger challenge in all this. And um, that's where this gets really tricky because the truth wasn't really honored. And the corruption was so deep in the relationships, unfortunately, um, between certain police officers who were individuals who were not honoring their code and relationships they had with death row. And, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a unique web that has, uh, un, you know, that's literally why the book was called Labyrinth. I mean, it's, it's, it's a labyrinth. It's, 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 it's pretty wild. And you see through the movie, um, we start one place and we go another and another, and they're all very much interconnected. That was crazy too. I just want to speak on something real quick. Um, there's a lot of theories that have been, um, you know what I'm saying, kind of flushed into the marketplace. And, you know, just like anything else, like, you know, there are facts, then there's truth, then there's reality. And not all times you get all those things in one to get a better understanding or a true gauge of exactly what happens, right? Um, this film speaks from a factual standpoint. There's nothing about it that stands on theory or ideologies or notions. These are facts. Um, and these facts can be presented. Um, and I think that that's the one. And that, um, you know, just like anything else, it will be embellished because it's the business of entertainment. But this is not just about entertainment. This is about, you know, people's lives. It's about finding out what really happened, how it happened, and who did it. This is not one of those who done it cases in terms of um, uh, a mystery, if you will. Um, the facts point to, you know, what I'm saying some real, real strong um, elements that really kind of give you a, a lay of the land of what happened and how it happened. However, there's a lot of things still that can't be spoken on because one, the case is quote unquote still pending. Um, and two, you know, we also wanna make sure that the facts that are presented are presented in a way that we can actually deliver to you exactly the information necessary for you to truly understand um, the dynamics of not only what this film represents, but what um, inequality and police brutality and um, that the essence of um, bringing us to a place of understanding our own uh, shortcomings, if you will, um, by presenting the facts the way that the way that we are actually doing so not only in this film, but just in so many different people across the board speaking out um, about the black and brown people's elements of being able to elevate, become more purposeful in life um, in the eyes of others. I think that's a very key fact. Was that part of the reason why you chose to um, work on this um, drama versus possibly doing uh, yet another documentary because maybe dramatically showing it makes it hit harder. So you know what? Get it? At, at the end of the day, it's like, you, I mean, you could tell so many Biggie stories. You could tell so many things about not only his life, but his death. You can talk about the different levels of corruption across the board, whether it be in the music business or, you know, I'm saying how we're talking about police brutality here. 
um, or corruption or deception or whatever you want to, you know what I'm saying, classify it as. But at the end of the day, um, I think that this story was so important that it needed its own, its own face. It needed its own sensibility, if you will, right? And yes, it's about Christopher. It even mentions Tupac, God rest his soul. But at the end of the day though, none of that really matters because what matters is the core of the story. What is the core of the story? How does it relate? How does it relate to the people? How would it relate to the, re the viewers? How does it affect you, right? From an emotional standpoint, from a connectivity standpoint. And I think if you look at it from that standpoint, then this is just a crime drama that's dope as shit, period, right? Let's extract all of the names and all of the different elements about it. We're bringing you the reality of what happens in these communities day after day, night after night, right? Mothers afraid to send their sons out to, go to the corner store just to, you know what I'm saying, pick up a pack of Skittles, if you will, or, you know what I'm saying, their, their daughters to walk outside because, you know what I'm saying, at the end of the day, you don't know how these people are going to attack them, right? Um, it's just a lot of different nuances that you know we could speak about in so many different terms but the bottom line is this is a crime thriller right and it's a crime thriller that we live in our communities every day and it needs to stop period it needs to stop this is to bring light to that i think um in addition to what wayne was saying for me as a as a, someone who was a fan of biggie a fan of Pac, and the deep influence that um, black culture and them as individuals has had on me, I felt a very deep responsibility in making the movie to humanize these gentlemen. Because when you, re re when you become this massive, iconic, larger than life figure, we as other human beings and fans lose sight of the fact that Biggie was a father and that Biggie was a son to a mother. So that's why it was so crucial and important to me to have the blessing and support of Ms. Wallace and Wayne and everyone and work hand in hand with them because I felt a deep burden of responsibility that, that I couldn't take on this responsibility and challenge without you know, hand in hand. And I don't have the experience of being you know, black or brown and walking in those shoes. So it's even more important that I understand that and I'm aware of that and in being cognizant of that, you know, make sure that we're all working together. And, you know, change is something in a large way that is really hard to do, but it does start with each and every individual. So if the movie ultimately from a messaging standpoint makes you angry, which people have said to me, or makes you stop and think, or makes you question, then maybe just maybe from an individual standpoint and then a collective standpoint, we can begin to, you know, start asking the hard questions, but really making the right choices within ourselves to do the right things as individuals, but equally to demand the people within the institutions to be doing the right things as well. And as Wayne said, it's pervasive of what's going on in our society today. And um, you know, to me, that's what's so important about the film from that perspective. But Wayne is right, it is all encased in this you know, unfolding narrative of this dramatic crime thriller and Johnny Depp and Forrest Whitaker are really the Trojan horses carrying the messaging to the world. And that's why I love Brad so much, Nicole. <laughs> Thank you. At the end of the day, I got to get this out. It's like, there's not many people that you come across that is honest about their understanding of, of the world, right? Um, not everybody wants to put themselves in the block and say, you know what? Yeah, I, I don't know too much about Black culture, but let me go ahead and exploit it, right? We get a lot of that. Brad is the exception of that. Like that is my guy. That's my brother right. because he's been honest from the start and pure. And these conversations are important and these conversations are definitely needed. Um, you know what I'm saying? Between our communities, be between our mindsets. We're all human, no matter how you slice it. We're all human. We're spiritual beings. So how we live our lives, of course, is going to be based on, you know what I'm saying, how we support ourselves in this space, um, you know what I'm saying, of humanity. And I just want to give kudos to him for being one of those standout individuals that puts, you know what I'm saying, race aside and just understands not only, you know what I'm saying, his place in society, but his place in the culture of hip hop, which is made for everybody. I wanted to just even build on that. The, the movie does not stray away from showing crookedness on both sides, right? There are black crooked cops and there are white crooked cops, right? But, but it must have been difficult to um, create this dramatic character 
that doesn't seem like a white savior, right? So how, as a creative, did you balance that? Well, I really felt that, so I was supposed to meet Russ Poole and then in about two weeks, like I was two weeks away from meeting him and I got the word he had passed. And um, so I never had the chance to really sit down with him, but I had spent, you know, a, a bunch of time with Megan Poole and the Poole family and got a chance through their lens. And also Randall Sullivan, who wrote Labyrinth, was very, very close with Russ. So I had flown up to Portland. Um, you know, Perry Sanders was, you know, their, their attorney at the time on the wall civil case. So I was around all of these people who knew Russ. And all I kept hearing from Russ was about his integrity. He was this man wrought with integrity and that has nothing to do with race. That's just about him as a human being, as Wayne said, and his integrity. And I wanted to exemplify and personify that. And at the end of the day, um, no different than I came into this world, I was birth white and Jewish. I had no control over those things. You know, I actually claimed being Jewish, not because I was religious, but because I dealt with so much anti-Semitism as a kid. And ironically, you know, who came to my back as a child were all my black friends. All my black friends had my back, always. Why that is, how that happened, you know, I don't always have the answers for those things. But in my personal experience and in channeling things through the real Russ Pool, it was about a man, a human being with integrity. And that was what I was trying to push forward in what I felt was important about the narrative. The other thing, because I feel like, especially with social media and the internet and, and the microscope, I felt that Biggie to me is more impactful than JFK because Biggie is my hero. You know, Christopher spoke to me. You know, I saw Tupac first time with the bandana and Rolling Stone. It was like a two inch picture. I was like, who is that guy? I was drawn to the imagery of that man. I was drawn to his poetry. I was drawn to the interviews where he was like, why are we not housing people in the White House? I'm like, who is this guy saying these things? He's, he's brilliant. I was researching Afeni and Black Panthers and, and, and his unique education that inspired him. And I was trying to read and get my hands on everything. And all of these things from these two individuals in particular and so many others, all of my love. That's why I became a filmmaker truthfully, just to just give you an inclination because of Spike Lee. When I watch Do the Right Thing and there's the scene in the pizza shop where he's asking him who his heroes are and he's naming all of these black people. I was like, oh my God, that's my life. I was like Michael Jordan, <laughs> you know, all of these favorites. Jodeci was like, I couldn't stop playing, you know, stay in forever, my lady. So for me, I, I felt that in, in understanding my point of view on the world, I understand the distinction between race, but I would be dishonorable and dishonest if I wasn't brutally honest about the impact that the culture and black culture as a whole has shaped my whole foundation and everything that makes me the man that I am. So thereby to, I think, move forward in all of the collective decisions of this movie, I understood that this was treacherous ground. I understood that somebody said to me, you don't know the streets like this. People are gonna rise up against you. I understood I had friends in the LAPD and the sheriff's office who called me and said, this goes to the top, don't touch this. Um, but it was all of those reasons that I felt like that's why I need to, to tell the story and, and take the risk. Because in life, if we don't take risks, then, then what do we have? And it's the risks we take that ultimately define us as individuals. And, you know, the reality is, if you would have said to me, hey, I'm going to be on all hip hop talking with Wayne and you and doing all this, like, that would be amazing. But as this journey has progressed, I've recognized every step of the way this is just so much bigger than me as an individual. I'm just a conduit to something so much bigger. So if our conversation sparks conversation with other people and you get to see a white guy here today or whatever you perceive me as from the audience point of view, then great, because you can understand we can all commune and come together to figure stuff out. And that's really, as Wayne said eloquently, what the world is about, communication and union. So- I really thought that you did a great job in um, balancing that um, throughout the film, it was it was actually interesting to see um, how you were able to unearth actually certain things, nuances that if you aren't familiar with certain cultures, you wouldn't have 
you know, seen, you know, you wouldn't have picked up, you know, so mm -hmm. hats off to you for that. I appreciate <laughs> that. I mean, it just, just to be brutally frank about it. Um, I felt when I was really young, cause when you're young, there's like an impressionistic thing that happens to you. Honestly, I felt all my black friends were cooler than me. Um, truthfully, most of them, the way that, no, I'm being real with you, the way they move, the way they dance, the way they were smoother than me as a young boy, those things were challenges for me. Cause I felt like I was unable to do things in the manner and the way that I felt they were. But ultimately in my growth and maturity as an individual and through the support of my family and hard work and my efforts and things I strove for, I became comfortable with myself and I became I learned to love me in the process. And, and then when you become whole with yourself, like say you're striving to be a filmmaker, you're not striving to be Spike Lee or Marty Scorsese. I just want to be Brad. And that, that, that took a long time to figure those things out. But, you know, um, man, I mean, I, I, know, uh, I know Wayne represented him, but when uh, Tyrese Gibson and I have been tight for almost 20 years now, when I first met Reese, you know, he said to me, you're my, you're my first and only white friend. And like that came as a shock because you saw culturally we were from like different universes, but he couldn't understand somebody like me talking to him about Casey and Jojo. Like he was like, he did not, he thought I was like an alien. He was totally confused by it, but we connected on these things. And I think ultimately, you know, and I, under, I, I can say this when I've had my black friends say to me, that it is painful to have the culture like sort of pillaged and raped and like like used and you hear about it in the rap song, you know, Jay speaks about it, Kanye speaks, about it. like there's a truth to that because people are profiteering off the genius and brilliance of black culture. And that's really full circle for me. What I was concerned with in making the movie was not only is this not about profiting, but it, it's, it's about, I don't, especially don't wanna profit off the murder of this man that inspired my life so so that was a unique like thing that you have to traverse through and again that's why i was like i will not make the movie under any circumstances without the support of the shakur estate so i made changes to the movie because the short shakur estate asked me after they preview the movie we want to have this change we want to have this change there was no requirement legally to do that. And this isn't like, oh, I'm Brad. I'm trying to be like, uh, no, I did it because I felt deeply in my heart, man, if I could sit with Pac, like if I could sit with Big, if I could sit and have a conversation with them, those guys were my heroes. So like I wanted to do, if, 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 if Pac left everything he had to his estate and to Tom Wally, because he loved Tom and said, take care of everything, whether you know he knew that or not, and Tom wanted X, I was doing X. So th this was my whole thing. Like the Poole family had to be on board, the estate, the Wallace estate had to be on board, the Shakur estate, but everybody had to be on board or else I just couldn't go to bed at night. And that was just non-negotiable for me. So how did you convince Forrest Whitaker and Johnny Depp <laughs> to be a part of the project? Um, Those are big deals. Well, here's the thing on that, and it's actually not complicated. Movies are typically financed by uh, an, an actor's international value, which triggers the financing. And I start with that because basically as a filmmaker, you get a little list, right? And you're like, you got to get one of these 10 people. And I literally only wanted to make this movie with Johnny Depp because I felt that I was concerned that a version of a detective, a white detective, in this instance, I was just worried the detective it could be boring. Like maybe it's just like too straightforward, this obsessed guy. But I knew in the hands of Johnny, it would be really intriguing and different and eccentric and unique. And so creatively, that's why I wanted Johnny. But also just having now learned the business and this not being my first movie, I knew that the messaging of this movie was the most important thing. And what better of a way to Trojan horse it into the vessels of a Depp and a Whitaker? I feel like I might only be speaking to you today because Depp and Whitaker are in this movie. I, you know, I go meet Wayne and Miss Wallace. I'm calling them saying, I have Johnny Depp and, and Forrest Whitaker in my movie. I never asked them, did that open a door for you or didn't it? But I have to assume just being a knowledgeable, aware human being, that's not a little deal. These are titans. These are two massive heavyweights in the ring, so to speak, you know, going head to head that I am so honored 
to have stood side by side with and made this film with. So it was a very artistic decision with Johnny to start and Forrest second, but it was also immensely strategic because I felt like to me, this story was not just my JFK, the world's JFK. And therefore, how do you get that to the world? And then I was like, well, you bring in the two Trojan horses and ever, you know, Johnny and Forrest, boom. And that's sort of where it began. So we're going to wrap it up soon. It's been a half an hour, but I do want to um, throw something. Wayne, can you give us a moment with Big that just touches your heart and um, just makes us feel amazing about this titan of a person? Oh, Keep using the word titan. That's, um, wow. It's like um, stories is something that I hate to do. Um, they're just so personal to me, but... Um, um, I'm not going to give you a story. I'm going to give you a fact, since I'm speaking on facts today. Um, Christopher Wallace was a humorous individual. Um, not a moment went by where there was laughter in the room. Um, it was this, he was an amazing spirit, um, gentle giant, if you will. And I think that he's touched a lot of lives, both personally and indirectly. And that um, that kind of spirit, that type of individual, um, when you're talking about stories, there's not one that can really signify the magnitude of how important and how loving, how kind and generous this man was. However, don't get it twisted. He was definitely an individual with another side. And that other side, you know what I'm saying, would snap your neck if in fact, you know, you stepped out of line or disrespected him or his family. Uh, family being himself, his friends, and you know what I'm saying, those that he loved. Um, at the end of the day, I miss him. Um, and, you know, I vowed to take, you know, think care of his mother and his kids as best I could. And over the last 24 years, I've done all that I can to assure that I lived up to that commitment and will continue to do so in keeping his legacy alive. So um, when it comes to big, there's no one greater. There's no person that I've come in contact with that has such a bigger heart. Um, and, you know, again, I'm honored to be a part of, of his life and his legacy, definitely. Well, you can't blame a chick for trying to, trying to get something out of you. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not mad at that. It's just no, you know, no, when no, you get no. asked that question of stories, it's like, you know what I'm saying? Like, do you really want to share that, right? Um, and I'm in, a, I'm in a different mode today because of, you know what I'm saying, everything that's going on in the world. And, you know what I'm saying, we, are, we all need laughs and we need joy, but I'd rather keep it toned down to the specifics of the man that I know he was. And I want people to pay attention to the fact that this film is out today, B.O.D., uh, City of Lies with Johnny Jeff and Boris Whitaker. And I just want people to go out there and support what Brad Furman has done from a directorial standpoint to be able to deliver such greatness to the film um and to the public and um, in closing for me i want to give a, another rest in peace to the brother dmx mm -hmm. god bless him much respect to him and his family my condolences to rough riders dy swiss the entire team god bless y'all god bless and brad what about you your favorite biggie a moment lyric whatever and then we can wrap it up Thank you. Oh, for you make it that easy for me. Uh, you should have asked me a lyric. Damn. Okay. What's your favorite no, lyric? What's your favorite lyric? Nope, nope, nope. I gave my Come speech. Away, ahead, Brad. Give it to us. Rock out, Brad. Rock out, man. <laughs> I, I, I'll just, I knew uh, my family had uh, relocated to San Diego and, and I went to visit my mother and she was walking around the house one day. And this is what I heard from the other room Biggie, 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 can't you see? And I went, What did you just say? And she said, what? I said, what were you just singing? And my mother was walking around the house singing Biggie, Biggie, Biggie. And I, that just blew my mind that, that he had reached my mother. <laughs> like my mom was not raised listening to hip hop or rap or like he had reached my mother. So I don't know where she had heard it on the radio or the video, who knows, but that for me was a defining moment that I'll never forget. And she was always singing it. So uh, that was a beautiful, beautiful moment. Um, 
for me to, to see the impact uh, universally that he had. Um, but actually, uh, quickly, I got to see Biggie live before he was uber famous at uh, some underground spot in New York City. And I did not know who he was. And he just, I don't know if it was planned. He got up and freestyle. He rocked that place. And that was my first exposure to him. And um, that was unbelievable. I mean, it was, it was amazing. So um, like I said, I'm just honored to be here and super appreciative and um, rest in peace to DMX. Uh, that, that, that's a tough one really, really tough one. And uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to, to be here with you, but also to, to be with Wayne. He is, um, man, I, I'm, uh, I'm always speechless when it comes to Wayne. He's a, a special, special, special human being to me. And, um, you know, truly an inspiration. You can, you can hear in how he expresses himself and the depth of it and uh, the integrity of it. There's very, few people that I come across who who have that type of gravitas and he's one of them and um so super oh, cool shit. Yeah. let me find out word that's <laughs> I sound good on paper boy <laughs> you do I, so, Nicole, I, I, we can't let you get away with this though you got to give us your favorite biggie moment since you're putting us under pressure what do you mean? I told you when I saw him live before Nicole. he was famous. Nicole. Oh, Nicole. Nicole. Okay, good. I was going to say. See what I mean? How smart Nicole. he's covered every angle. Let's go. All right, Nicole, Bring give it. it to us. Come on, sis. Two favorite Biggie moments. Um, one is um, he performed in Philly. Troy Carter brought him down. I want to say that was like the summer of 95. Maybe no, you've heard of Yeah. yeah like 95. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were at this hot club called the Red Zone, and it's just like sweating. Mm. He's <laughs> he still performed, but he most certainly um, needed a lot of water. So that was funny just to hear his joke, uh, him like kind of joking about how hot it was in there, you know? Right. So that was funny just to be able to hear him that way. And then once, um, I guess we were out, he sent us to the store to get chicken and um, like Popeyes. <laughs> just how yeah. regular he was, but he was funny, like just go and do it. Like, you know, so... Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, of course, there's the music and stuff, but he was just too young. So, so that's that, too young. Just too that's young. Good. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. And it's a lot of us that, um, yeah, we 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 we're going too young. Yeah, so those that young. are here, we need to definitely stay strong, come together, and really do all we can to love each other. Definitely gotta love each other more. You know, and if you can, I want everybody to go out and watch City of Lies. It's on um, video on demand. And it is an amazing and very interesting um, mystery crime film that looks at somebody that somebody we all love and um, recognize as a great person at the core of it. But it is a bigger story than just Biggie's death, right? So and it's actually apropos for this time because a lot of um, prison reform and, and, and police reform is happening now and this film spotlights the need for it. So we thank you, Brad, and we thank you, Wayne, for taking your time with All Hip Hop and congratulations on the film and much success with it. Thank you, Nicole. Very much. Thank you, Nicole. All right, you Been guys. too long, sis. I know. <laughs> <laughs>